this is my talk today. And uh, I have to say that uh, after Rita Marino, the most famous uh, Puerto Rican for me for a long time was Rafael, who's speaking later. But then I met Eric and he persuaded me to come here. Uh, he also gave me this title, which was a shock. Uh, I didn't notice at first that this was the title he gave me until I started to prepare my talk. And I thought, oh my God, what does this mean? Uh, so I used the Wikipedia, as you'll see, to find out what microarrays are and to find out what clinical research is, and then I'm doing my best. Okay, so uh, what are microarrays? Now, Raphael is going to give you an in-depth discussion of that. So I'm giving you the superficial one, that these were initially used to measure gene expression. As we'll see later, that's a lie, but it's uh, the most popular, widely used, is correct. Uh, that is transcript or messenger RNA abundance. Exxon and splice arrays came a bit later, which I'll mention. Later, genotyping microarrays became very popular, and probably actually they are the most popular uh, microarrays at the present moment. More recently, uh, not at all popular, uh, targeted resequencing. For example, all exons from a collection of disease-related genes. And I've actually been involved in all of these, so I'm okay on the microarray side of things. I'm not very okay on the clinical side of things because, as we'll see. Now, there are other uses for microarrays, which I'm not going to mention, and there are other microarrays. These are DNA or uh, RNA microarrays, nucle uh, nucleic acid microarrays. There are protein microarrays and other sorts which are not anywhere near clinical use. Okay, so this is a generic picture, which uh, it's always good to have something familiar. Uh, DNA, RNA, uh, protein, and, of course, uh, the point of this picture is that we are measuring the abundance of mRNAs, which are these uh, purpley bits here, which, uh, apart from uh, some 3' prime and 5' prime untranslated, will be in triples, which later get translated into uh, peptides, into amino acid sequences. So the expression microarrays are measuring abundance of mRNA sequences. By contrast, the SNP microarrays are trying to help you answer the question is a particular uh, sequence of DNA an A or a G, for example, at a particular position? So uh, if you um, feed these microarrays uh, a reasonable number of copies of a particular nucleic acid sequence, which has a variable position somewhere in it, this is a variable position, and the others will have to be, in general, invariable, then uh, SNP genotyping will answer the question... Uh, and unfortunately, it's a little more complicated than just A or G because we are diploid organisms and usually we feed genomic DNA to the chip, in which case uh, it might be two A's, two G's, or an A and a G. And uh, the uh, SNP microarray technology is designed to answer that question, not just for one SNP, but maybe a million SNPs, all at the same assay from one particular individual sample. Uh, by contrast, the targeted resequencing is really trying to sequence, every, trying to tell you what is at every single position. So here's a position along a genome, and there are here these uh, offset complementary nuclear complementary probes that I'm going to describe in the next slide. And basically, in this story, we're trying to find out what is exactly at a particular position, instead of A or G. I'm sorry, this slide contrast is not so great, but uh, you could probably imagine it says there G-A-C-T, and that's the complementary one. So this is the forward strand, this is the reverse strand, and we're basically, you're not sure, uh, with a SNP microarray, you typically know that it is one or the other, and then you're looking for uh, either homozygous for one, homozygous for the other, or the heterozygous. Here, we don't know anything about that what that sample is at that position. So you have four probes for the forward strand and extra information for the reverse strand. And typically, this will be put on an array which has all of these sequences. And the material that you're going to hybridize to the array won't be whole genome. It will be appropriately amplified segments from the different genes that you're targeting. So targeted resequencing, typically exons, and... In principle, there could be a SNP at any particular position. So instead of three possibilities, you have ten, four homozygotes and six heterozygotes. And the aim here is typically to sequence entire exons. Uh, this is not 
terribly widely used, this technology, uh, and, but I, I've been working on trying to make it more widely used. Then along came sequencing, and nobody cares anymore, but that's... Okay, so this is my one slide on the technology, and then the rest is up to Raphael. I'll be talking a lot about Affymetrix chips, which are these things, and they have typically, uh, well, up to 7 million little regions, little regions which are called probes and uh, uh, called features, and each feature has up to about a million probes, which are the blue guys here. They are fixed to the array, and the things that bind to them in the typical Watson-Crick way are labelled complementary sequences. So they're the yellow things or the orange things, and the little star here is meant to be the label. And I'm not going to talk about the technology because Raphael's doing it. But basically, all three of the problems that I mentioned, measuring expression, doing chips, and targeted resequencing, can be done on this sort of array. Agilin and Illumina will do expression and uh, uh, SNP genotyping, but, uh, excuse me, Agilin won't be doing SNP genotyping. Either. Together they'll do two out of three, uh, but they don't uh, do resequencing at this point. So this is the, as I say, the one technology one. And that is my overview of arrays. Maybe there's a quick question. Uh, it's always good to have a question to sort of relax the audience and even more importantly, to relax the speaker. Sir? What's the difference that is between targeted resequencing and sequence capture that they're now proposing for? Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah, sequence capture is uh, a, a use of microarrays basically to fish out of a complex mixture of DNA fragments which will be of interest for the next step, which is actual sequencing using a DNA sequencing machine, typically next generation, which is my second last slide. But uh, there you're really just capturing the DNA. You're not trying to find out what it is. It's like a fishing hook. Right? Go in, pull out what you want, then go off to another assay to find out what it is. This, this guy, you're really trying to find out what it is now. Yeah. So you have, you have the probes that cover the entire sequence of interest with variable position, variable probes at each position, uh, eight variable probes at each position. Exactly, yeah. Thank you for the question. Greatly appreciate it. Number two. You have to wait for my second last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, I really did not know what clinical medicine is. I had a little rough idea, of course, but uh, given that that's my title, I better get a more precise idea. So I go to the universal reference for everybody these days. The branch of medical science that determines the safety and effectiveness of medications, devices, diagnostic products, and treatment regimens intended for human use. I think there's been an awful lot of microarray studies which use human tissue, human cells. Uh, I'm more required here to talk about human use associated, of course, with disease. Useful for the prevention, treatment, diagnosis, or relieving of symptoms of disease. And that's actually a far smaller application of microarrays. That's what I'm going to tell you today. Okay, so what are you going to get? I'm going to describe four expression microarray products, two SNP genotyping microarray products, and three resequencing microarray non-products, uh, just to give you an idea of efforts at using microarrays in clinical research. And now we've got the idea of how to ask a question. Please feel free to indicate that you'd like to ask a question anytime. I mean, I can stop now and say, is there another question? But uh, just give me a little hint. Okay, so I'm going to start off with expression microarray products. And uh, I've stolen this picture from the website of a company called Agendia, which is based in the Netherlands. Uh, and you can see there, their product is called Mammaprint. And if you don't know what Mammaprint is, I'm going to tell you in the next slide. But this lady here is talking to this guy who uh, could be a husband, could be a doctor, could be a salesman for uh, Mammaprint technology. I'm not sure. But anyway, what's Mammaprint all about? Well, it's a 70-gene microarray gene expression signature discovered at the Netherlands Cancer Institute to identify younger breast cancer patients, lymph node negative disease, who are at low risk of developing distant metastasis. 
That's a category of breast cancer patients, young. We'll talk about what young means a bit later. Uh, and lymph node negative is, of course, just a diagnostic criterion that a doctor can do. And uh, how do you tell which of these younger lymph node negative women are likely to develop distant metastases and which are probably going to be okay? Well, that's what this mammoprint is about. Because if they're going to be okay, they can be spared the very unpleasant chemotherapy regime which might normally be prescribed for all such lymph node negative disease. Okay, so it is a microarray, as you can see there. This is, uh, it has eight segments. It's an Agilent microarray. That's one of the eight segments. That's the, the eight of them together. It's a two-color array. The probes are 60 mers, uh, and it says here, there's 1,900 probes. Test samples are hybridized against the breast cancer RNA pool. Uh, I'm not going to explain about the technology of two cancer microarrays, uh, excuse me, two color microarrays, uh, but you have your sample of interest from the woman, the breast cancer patient, then you have a reference sample, and then you get a signal, and I'll, I'll actually be telling you quite a bit more about mammoprint a little bit later, but that's all I'm going to say for the moment. There's a particular targeted audience, and it is widely used in Europe, less so in the US, because there is a rather similar competing uh, assay, uh, which is, doesn't use microarrays, so I don't get to talk about it. But it's uh, uh, created by a company called Genomic Health, and it uses quantitative real-time PCR, and it uses 21 genes rather than 70. Okay, so the next uh, company I want to mention, and also from their website, is the Pathwork Diagnostic Company. And, uh, well, this is a not terribly attractive uh, front page of their website. But what do they do? Well, they have a test called the tissue of origin test. Carcinomas of unknown primary represent 3 to 5% of cancers, malignant neoplasms. Uh, I guess you all know that typically when people, let's say a woman gets breast cancer, uh, she's probably not going to die of breast cancer. She might die of bone cancer or of lung cancer, which will be metastasized form of the breast cancer. Uh, and uh, sometimes, and you can imagine, if it's in a lung, uh, you might look and say, well, is this a lung cancer this person smoked? Or is it a lung cancer that came from a cancer somewhere else? And it's metastasized. And knowing that will be quite important in how you treat it, whether it's a primary lung cancer or a, meta or a secondary one. So uh, it turns out that this is not such a trivial task. Looking at a cancer and saying, um, is this a primary or is this a secondary? And that's this Pathwork tissue of origin test is meant to answer that question. It has patterns for 1,550 genes, and they're compared to 15 known tissue types. So uh, this is just a quick slide. Tissue, do the usual sort of stuff. This is actually done on a custom Affymetrix array of the kind I mentioned earlier. And then they have an analytic system, of course. Some statistical trickery goes on. You get the expression pattern put it into some algorithm, and out comes, you see here, very high probability of colorectal cancer was the primary in this particular little example. So that's, sir. So. Uh, I sort of have a question provided, sort of a comment. Please. But it's a bit against the grain. Uh, but, so Hit me on the head. Okay, I hope you all heard that. He wants me to be sucked into his belief, <laughs> not the other ones. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're on to my third uh, microarray uh, expression product, and this is a company called ExxonHit. 
uh, and they have yet to make a hit, but they're almost on the verge of it. I'm just going to focus here on a... These are diagnostic microarrays, and they have one which is research use only that I'm going to de uh, describe very briefly. Uh, it, the Aclaris di Diagnostics is a blood-based biomarker identifying patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease. It's designed to discriminate Alzheimer's disease patients from healthy individuals. Uh, this is becoming increasingly important for myself and other people who are getting older. Uh, intended to be used in association with standard methods of testing. Its market entry was uh, December last year as a research use only, and of course they are moving on to want to get full FDA approval. Uh, and this product is on a custom microarray made by Affymetrix once more. Uh, sample collection, RNA extraction, and this is actually a so-called splice array. So this company, Exxon Hit, is focusing on splice variants as the message rather than general expression patterns. And forgive me if you don't know what a splice variant is, but perhaps someone else will say a little more about this later. So here we go, splice array, scan, do some statistical trickery again, uh, whether in the belief that cancer is a single or hundreds of diseases, I'm not sure, but this for the purposes of Alzheimer's, we don't need to know the answer, and then go to some uh, decision and targets. Okay, so that's uh, Exxon hit. Uh, they're on the verge of uh, getting a FDA-approved product. And the final uh, example I'm going to give is a little company, and I have to... Uh, express, uh, well, not exactly conflict of interest, but interest. I am associated with this country, but it's not a financial interest, I have to say, just a scientific one. And they're interested at the present moment in thyroid cancer. And this is a very interesting uh, little company. I like it a lot. An estimated 450,000 thyroid biopsies are performed in the US each year. Less than 10% of these actually come to be cancer. An estimated 100,000 thyroidectomies are performed every year on benign nodules. Okay, so I don't know if any of you know anybody who's had their thyroid removed, but this is not a good thing, particularly if it wasn't necessary. This procedure is costly and invasive, and patients are required to take hormone supplements for the rest of their lives. So it does seem a laudable aim to see if you can identify the 100,000 people out of the 450,000 who did not need to have their thyroid removed. And that's the aim, that's the first product that this little company, Verisite, is trying to develop. Uh, and they're just using a non-custom, a standard Affymetrix exon array. Which, uh, so Verisite uses Affymetrix human exon array to try to identify benign thyroid nodules and other classes, of course, because you have to distinguish the benign nodules from various other subcategories of thyroid cancer. Uh, and I've been a little, uh, I'm on their scientific advisory board and give a little bit of help. So that's uh, Verisite. Uh, is there a question about those four before I move on to SNPs? Happy to have questions? Yes. Well, uh, I guess the idea is uh, you're looking at the different subtypes. This is based on fine needle aspirates, so you get a relatively small number of cells, and then you uh, extract mRNA and put it on the exon array, and then get patterns for all the different subtypes, including the various benign ones, and try to make a decision that this is a clear-cut Yes, yeah. Well, I'll get to that step a little bit later, not in the specific context of uh, uh, Verisite, but in the context of Mammoprint, because I'm going to talk about the steps that you go through to get these products. And then, of course, it will involve exactly what you've just said. Thank you. Another question or comment? Okay, so SNP genotyping. Well, um, this, uh, talk, this part of my talk would be better given by one of our latest speakers, because this is a product called the AmpliChip from Roche. Uh, and uh, here's this. Did she tell you about her poor metabolism? Well, uh, I guess one of these people is a doctor and the other is talking to a friendly patient. Anyway, what's the point of this? Uh, the point is that the uh, Roche product is the first FDA-cleared pharmacogenetic test uh, on a microarray, of course. Uh, and it's called the AmpliChip Cytochrome P450. And it has probes for two particular 
uh, cytochrome P450 genes, and uh, it is identifies patients' genotypes, and based on this, provides patients' predicted phenotype, poor, intermediate, extensive, or ultra-rapid metabolizers. Will you be saying a little more about this general topic in your talk? Yeah, so there'll be a later talk which, uh, by somebody who knows what they're talking about uh, rather than just reporting, and it's meant to provide information that could help prevent adverse reactions to drugs. You're going to hear about this later. Uh, from the point of view of my contribution, this is a microarray again, a microarray in a clinical application. And there it is, cytochrome P450 array, Amplichip, Roche, Affymetrix. Uh, and unfortunately, this picture doesn't come out very well. But basically, again, it's, it's, it's a specialised SNP genotyping array. So uh, you've got probes that are complementary to the regions where there is variation in the population. And, I, and you see here, for a particular example, wild type, mutant, and heterozygote. And I'm not, he's not going to be talking about microarrays, but there are various assays. And of course, most of what I'm saying, there will be similar companies doing things with real time PCR or maybe other high, high throughput molecular assays. But my task is to talk about microarrays. So that's what you're getting. Sorry. Uh, how many SNPs in those? I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, quite a few, for sure. Definitely quite a few. I mean, uh, they, they had to cover every base, not in the specific sense, but in the, you know, in the colloquial sense. They had to be really sure to get this chip approved by the FDA. So a lot of redundancy built in. Uh, to make it essentially foolproof, a point which I'll make later. But I don't know the answer to exactly how many SNPs they're interrogating. Okay, so here we have now, I'm sure many of you have heard of 23andMe. One of the people I practiced this talk on said I should have made this first because everybody in the audience will have heard of 23andMe and nobody will have heard of Mammoprint. And I said, that's not true. We're going to have some real medical people in the audience who think this is frivolous and Mammoprint is serious. Uh, but anyway, they have, uh, as you can see here, 23andMe, welcome, ancestry, health. So this is their health product. And what is it? Well, uh, they use the Illumina Infimium HAP550 Quad Plus Bead Array. So you order the kit online from 23andMe. You spit into the kit that they give you. You uh, send it to them and they extract the DNA and then they give you the results on the computer. So this is uh, what's known in the trade. Well, there's a quad. These are uh, Illumina, so I'm not being uh, sort of uh, just publicising affymetrics. Uh, and this is, has, you can put four samples on this array. This is all done at 23andMe headquarters. This is known in the trade as a direct-to-consumer genomics. That is to say no medical people are interfering between the consumer and the people that take their money. Uh, it's just direct and the companies happen to be currently, uh, I got this quite recently, that uh, the FDA and the House Committee under Henry Waxman are asking these people to explain themselves because, of course, they are, in a sense, marketing medical products without any FDA approval, and one can only assume this is going to somehow get regulated as the machine grinds on. Okay, so that's the... Of course, that is a product, and it's a microarray-based product, it is not an FDA-approved product. And that's the end of my couple of examples about microarrays in SNP genotyping. And the final one I want to mention is resequencing microarrays because I know people have tried to get these things going. And now I can give you a little more correct history. Affymetrix really started life trying to do resequencing. They sold the expression arrays because they turned out to be more profitable and more appealing. And the resequencing side of it uh, didn't take off quite as well back uh, approximately 15 years ago. They've come back a bit more recently before the next generation revolution uh, and there are now quite a lot of custom resequencing arrays out there, but none of them have got to products. But the HIV array, well, this paper is in 1999. Uh, the mitochondrial array has been around a long time. This paper is 2004. Uh, and they also had a P53 array 
that sequenced all the uh, exons in P53. And, uh, well, this is just another little schematic to distract you. But basically, these three have been quite heavily promoted by, by Affymetrix, and then there are a lot of customer A's. For example, I'm involved in a collaboration with one for Parkinson's disease and another one for nuclear genes that are associated with mitochondrial disorders. And I know there are many more out there, uh, but none of them have got to the point of reaching a product because they cannot be as reliable as the FDA would require. I mean, uh, you'll see a bit later. Okay, so here's my plan for the rest. I think I'm okay for time to discuss some of the issues uh, with the use of expression arrays and then uh, talk a little about the biostatistics, bioinformatics involved in getting these products out to market. So here are some possible uses of expression microarrays in clinical research. Uh, but I have to say uh, it's unlikely any of them are ever going to be realised because, uh, as I will explain in my second last slide, microarrays are probably going to be history for this type of task very soon, if they're not already. I mean, it's quite a shame that I'm associated with this lovely little company trying to stop people from having their thyroid removed unnecessarily with a microarray technology, knowing that it is heading for the dustbin of history. But that's life. Okay, early detection, diagnosis, risk assessment, prognosis, prediction of the safety or efficacy of a response to a therapy. There are ideas for microarray products in all of these, and I've actually shown you a couple in particular associated with prognosis, and I'm going to sort of push that a little bit harder. If there's no questions or comments, I will move on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Maniprint. There are at least three FDA determinations by the F, uh, uh, on Maniprint, and I'm going to tell you a few things from the last, just the most recent, just to sort of show you some of the issues that arise. So uh, I've got this. You can get all of the stuff. The FDA has almost everything they ever deal with on the web, and you can go to the submission for the 510, 510K submission, uh, and this is from this thing here, K802. It's available at the accessdata.fda.gov. So Mammoprint, gene expression profiling test for breast cancer diagnosis, common name, multivariate device for cancer diagnosis, and it's a microarray-based gene expression analysis of a tumour. The result is an expression profile or fingerprint of the sample. And the correlation of the sample expression profile to a template, and that template is the mean expression profile of over 44 tumours with a known good outcome. So take your tumours which have a known good outcome. They come from women who did not have distant metastases. Look at your 70 genes and look how well a sample. You calculate the correlation with that molecular profile and put it into two categories, low risk and high risk. That's uh, the sort of the short version. Intended use is always an important aspect of an FDA approval. It is an in vitro diagnostic test service performed in a single lab using a gene expression profile of fresh breast cancer tissue samples to assess patient risk, performed for Patients less than 61 years old, so we now know what young means. Still doesn't get me, unfortunately. Uh, stage 1 or stage 2 disease, tumour size less than 50 centimetres, lymph node negative. So there's a stage and size criterion sort of snuck in here. The print results in, intended for use by physicians as a prognotic, prognostic marker only, along with other clinical pathological features. So that's the sort of uh, the long longer story about Mammoprint. Uh, now, um, I'm, this page summarises quite a lot of stuff in the report on the FDA. As you can imagine, they want to know how the test performs. So the technical validity of the microarray, <coughs> according to whole sort of protocols, comparison, whenever you get something approved with the FDA, you have to compare it to something. And they produce something that you compare it with. Now, in this case, they were comparing it to the previous one that got approved because this was the third in the line. They had a low-density microarray. And uh, the high-density samples, the precision uh, was uh, determined the performance between... Yeah. So I'm not giving any details there, just giving you the flavour. And here's a bit more flavour. They're very interested in the, f the classification performance, you know, false positives, false negatives. How does it perform on subsets? Uh, 
how does it deal with borderline samples, this sort of thing. And then at the end, they say, looking at all the generated data, it has concluded the member print analysis on a high-density microarray platform is considered to be substantially equivalent, well, to the one on the low density. <laughs> so that's not a very exciting conclusion. You have to track back the three others to see. But basically, they are looking at quite a lot of aspects of the product and comparing it to the thing that at somebody has deemed the appropriate comparator. Of course, there has to be a, a stack of clinical data going into this, otherwise it wouldn't be a clinical product. Now, the Mammoprint people, uh, I'm sure some of the people who've been involved or even shown a passing interest in microarrays and cancer will know of the 2002 Nature paper. First author was Laura Van Tevier, and uh, this developed the signature, 2002, uh, 76 patients, adjuvant treatment, five-year metastasis was the... And then they followed up later that year with a New England Journal paper, which was, <coughs> excuse me, meant to be the validation of that signature. Uh, the first author there was um, not Van de Veer, it was uh, Van de Viva. Uh, and then later there was a mammoth print paper that talked about the product that they had produced. came out quite a bit later, 2006, and then finally, there was a big study, uh, an independent European study, which gave the validation of the signature for the intended use population entirely separate from any of these developmental studies. So these are the sort of four stages. Uh, and, uh, well, that's pretty much... And at the end of it, Mammoprint is clinically and analytically accurate prognostic marker providing a risk assessment. This is a sort of summary of what they before they put the stamp of approval and sent it out the door. Yeah? I was looking at the lumber numbers just a little bit, and it seems that with the more independent the validation, the less uh, accurate the results become. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep, probably. These are the references that I mentioned. Uh, Van de Veer, the first paper that got the signature off the ground. Uh, Van de Viva, the one that uh, in the New England Journal that validated it. Uh, four years later, they have a product, and that came out in VMC Genomics. And then uh, later on, this is, this is an independent group in Europe, and they basically piggybacked on, on... This was a study that was already underway, and they looked at the subset of the people in this European study that fit their criteria and followed those prospectively. So, that's uh, all I'm going to say about uh, that particular... Thing. But here are the lessons that I extract from this that are of possible relevance to us. I see four stages from concept to market. There is an initial assay algorithm development. I mean, somebody has to study some samples and find a signature using some platform, whether it's a microarray or real-time PCR or uh, some sort of other technology. could be mass spec, who knows? Keith might tell us about that. You know, we might be able to get a 100% accurate test for distinguishing ovarian cancer using some sort of mass spectrometry technology. Anyway, that's the initial thing. Uh, this needs to be refined. So that, and an independent validation. I mean, typically you discover your signature and you look for something within your world which is a validation. This is not something that will make the FDA happy. But you've obviously got to do something more than just find it in one set of data. Otherwise, it's not worth moving forward. But the next step would be to get a product. And you know, if you only need 70 genes, then your product doesn't need 22,000 genes. It needs 70 genes. And you might have to build in a lot of redundancy in that step. And then you've got to deal with the product lab issues. How do you make this? I'm going to say a few more words. Then finally, you've got to do what the FDA wants. Now, each of these stages has its own biostatistical challenges, and I, I've seen some literature on them individually. I could not find any that discussed the whole package. It said, well, statistical issues associated with this. Now, maybe that's just because I'm a total newcomer to this field, or at least a relatively total newcomer. Okay, so <laughs> here's a few comments about step one. There are lots of issues associated with classification in step one. If... Uh, and I, I would say they take the problem beyond the standard machine learning approach commonly seen in the academic literature, where I'm using academic, obviously, in a pejorative sense, 
these people who are up in the sky, not accuracy of the truth. Uh, I know this is a thing that's been a huge issue with Verisite, the people doing the thyroid cancer. If you have the world's best thyroid cancer or thyroid pathologists and you give them the same set of samples, do you think you get 100% agreement? No, sir, you do not. And then how do they fight it out? And then how does that impact on your classification procedures? Of course, it impacts a lot. How, uh, if there are samples that the experts can't agree on, uh, how's your little classifier going to perform? Performance needs to be stratified into subtypes. I mean, it's great to say uh, lymph node negative, uh, younger patients, distant metastases, yes or no. But there's lots of other substructure there. And it might be that your test could be a disaster on some well-defined substructure that you could identify, even if overall it's great, or at least it's good enough to keep the FDA happy. So you've got to worry about these sort of things. Subtype prevalences. You know, it could be a rare but totally fatal subtype. And if your diagnostic doesn't deal with that well, that just gets averaged out. Oh, yeah, that's pretty rare. Only 5% of these people who are going to die instantly, but uh, our test will be pretty good for the other 25% who don't. So, so these things are a real issue. So, uh, and actually getting this subtype thing into a classifier, my experience has been that this is not something that has good literature out there right now. Maybe I'm just uh, not aware of it. Biological sense is often, if not always, needed in the markers and the predictors. That's an issue that people debate about. Do you want a black box predictor that is demonstrated to do well? Or do you want a white box predictor where every gene is somebody's favourite that also does well? <laughs> and, of course, we can argue about that. Much attention must be paid to normalising disparate data sets. <laughs> I mean, you know that if you're going to make a product, it has to work with everybody. So designing it just for your test samples is crazy. You've got to get as diverse sets of data as you possibly can in your, validation, your, your personal validation stage, and that means you've got to organise those data so you can actually analyse them all with the same predictor, which is not a trivial task. And finally, of course, uh, robustness as well as error rate is an important thing. Okay, so that's a few comments there. Uh, the MAQC2... Uh, which uh, has been around for a few years, and I'm sure there's one or two people in this room involved in it. Uh, it was meant to assess the capability. That means microarray quality control. Uh, I'll mention the one in a minute. Uh, assess the capabilities and limitations of various data analysis methods in developing and validating microarray-based predictive models. That was one of their aims. And to reach consensus on the best practices for development and validation of predictive models. So, in a sense, if these guys did their job well, we just say, yeah, let's do what they say. But uh, don't have too many illusions. There's not going to be a paper that answers all these questions definitively once and for all, but they do have a pretty broad set of data and they are addressing the important issues. Refinement of the assay and algorithm into a product is a very lengthy process. Uh, many things need to be considered here. Usually there's a switch from a commercial to a custom array. As I say, if you only need 70 genes, why, why would you use one that has 22,000? This is just one little thing from the, uh, the mammoth print <coughs> this stage, where along here we had the 25K array, and up here we just had their 70 gene array. So how do the same samples behave on a different array for the same genes? Well, we'd like them to be incredibly similar. Well, they're kind of similar. Uh, I'm not going to go into any details, but that's obviously one step when you just change platform. Uh, the, the assay has to be made foolproof. So that's just the long and the short of it. Standard operating procedures, quality assurance of reagents, quality control of results at every step, all sorts of qualifications need. Remember, you're getting this ready for FDA approval. So you have to have <coughs> excuse me, every little aspect. Lots of side studies that I'll mention later. Now, again, the um, product lab issues. The original MAQC is relevant here because they were taking a couple of samples, a uh, universal human reference sample and a brain sample, sending them to different labs on different platforms and comparing the results. That's clearly highly relevant if you're going to be switching platform uh, as you go from, as it were, a concept to a product. Now, I have an idea for QC here, but I am going to go flick, 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 and skip it. 
Sorry, folks. Uh, but I, you know, I, I can tell you what my idea was, but I, I realised that if I spelled it out, I would not finish on time. But basically, it's a problem that I am very interested in that I haven't really seen adequately addressed in the literature, and it is this. If you have a whole lot of arrays, let's say from, I don't know, five or six studies, it doesn't really matter very much, a pile of stuff that you've trained and you've got everything figured out beautifully. And now you're going to go into business. And your business is going to be analyse each array as they come in, right? One will come from you know, California, one from New York, one from San Juan, and you've got to do the analysis. Well, you have to worry about quality issues. Uh, and they'll be coming in serially. So they're not one batch that you could look at as a batch and say, yeah, let's do this sort of batch effect adjustment or let's adjust them. You have to have an online quality adjustment. And uh, this is quite a tricky issue, and I, and I have a little idea that I've flashed over here. It'll be in the slides I should have sent before they got in the book. Let me just explain. I couldn't get early enough to go in the book because I had to sweat quite hard in preparing this talk. It was only finished two days ago but it will be available later. So uh, you haven't got it to write nasty things on in front of you, but you'll get it later. And, and this little idea will be there. Okay, so stuff on side studies, method validation, process validation, stability studies, intermediate process, you know. They're very boring things, but the companies have to be obsessively careful with these things. Then you run your own large multi-center prospective clinical trial. This is for the FDA. Or you piggyback onto someone else's. Verisite is doing their own. Agendia did the latter. They piggybacked onto this European study. Either way, it must be with the intended use population, which may differ from the initial training test sets and any subsequent intervent validation. You really do need to make sure that the target that are going to be your customers are part of that study. Okay, so uh, this has been a pretty quick flash through. I haven't pause that much for questions. I am now going to go to my third last slide. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the elephant in the room uh, notion. There we are. That's my title. Now, it could have actually been the following title. <laughs> and I think if we had this meeting in a year's time, that's probably what it would have been. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's almost a sort of sad fact that most of what I've said is going to be sort of exponentially irrelevant as the next sequencing, next generation sequencing and the third generation that is sort of knocking on the door uh, continues to expand in the explosive way it is. And it'll be only a matter of time that all these microarray tasks, SNP genotyping, resequencing, expression studies, they just basically need to miniaturise so you don't have to buy a half a million dollar machine that you could buy a $50,000 machine. And of course, there's already one being mentioned in, uh, recently. So that's, the, uh, that's where I think microarrays and clinical research is going. The microarray bit of it is being removed and probably going to be replaced by next-gen DNA sequencing. OK, and I need to thank a pile of people before I stop. I've had a lot of interaction over the years with uh, my former student, Simon Corley, at Affymetrics. And with another former student, Francois Collin, who works at Genomic Health, uh, which does a real-time PCR version of Mammoprint, basically. Uh, Julie Kennedy from Verisite, where I mentioned I'm on their scientific advisory board. And Rich Einstein from Exxon Hit. I've had interaction with all these people and, of course, colleagues at Berkeley and uh, other places. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs>